Ho, ho, ho. Find out who's been naughty and nice on this episode of The Win Play Show. Salutations and welcome, friends. My name is Matthew DeSantis. You can find me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. And this is the Win Place Show, a program devoted to all aspects of horse racing and handicapping that is proudly part of the Trust the Profits YouTube page. Now, make sure before we get started to press that like button. Make sure to leave a comment below with your thoughts on the video. Who's on your naughty or nice list this time of year in terms of horse racing? And make sure to subscribe to Trust the Profits on YouTube to get all of our great content, not just when play show. I also do a weekly show capping the card where I go one through 10, one through 12, however many races are on the card. I give you my top pick, give you my top value play. Guess what? Last weekend, my top picks at Oakland, positive ROI. The week before that, top picks at Aqueduct, positive ROI. The week before that, positive ROI at Laurel. I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that you're getting, you're not tripling your money necessarily, but I'm making you money every single week on that show. So make sure to tune in. Now we got a lot of other great content on the Trust the Profits. You got Colin Sheehan doing all of his derby prep stuff as well as daily doubles. Definitely want to make sure to check that out. You got El Hombre doing the live stream and doing the lounge on Thursday nights. This Thursday, we're hitting up Turfway Park. We got it all covered. And actually, this week's Capping the Card, I'll have a special guest, Ryan Gamino, on this week with me. We're going to cap the Boxing Day, the post uh, post Christmas Day card and opening day at Santa Anita together. So that should be a lot of fun. So make sure to check that out. That'll be dropping later this week on the Trust the Profits page. Now, with all that being said, let's dive into what was actually a very busy week in horse racing. I know we're approaching the holidays. People have a lot of things going on. You're doing last second shopping. Do people even go out shopping anymore? I don't know. But they're doing a lot of last second clicking and ordering at the very least for the gifts for their loved ones. And let me just say up top, hope everybody has a happy and safe holiday season, whatever you might be celebrating, wherever you might be celebrating, and whomever you might be celebrating with. We uh, trust the prophets certainly wish you all of the best and a joyous 2023 as well as we wind down what has been eventful 2022. Now, this week, there was I, I can't bury the great story. The great story last week, we talked about Beverly Park and the fact this horse just keeps winning 29 races, 14 wins in a time and era in which horses don't get out very often. Well, today we're going to lead off the show with the winner of the Jeffrey A. Hawk Memorial Stakes. You don't do that every day of the week, that's for sure. And that was run at Remington Park on Saturday night and won by none other than the rated R superstar, not Edge, but rather the rated R superstar, the horse, who is nearly 10 years old. He will be 10 in two weeks, obviously, when everybody turns a, another year old in horse racing. But the nine-year-old wins and comes on late beating my long shot pick, number one dude, uh, who just got nosed out for second. That was uh, that was tough. I, I, I gave that one out on my Friday stable duel live stream with Gina Bacola and Barry Spears. Oh, that looks so good coming down the stretch, number one dude. Uh, and But rated R superstar, nine years old, gets the win. It's just a great story. And this is a horse that had run well at Oaklawn Park, had gotten a couple of stakes victories there late last year, early this year. Last couple of times out, though, really, you, you started to think maybe he started to finally show his age, which would be no... Uh, no shot at him at all. Nine years old, my gosh, very few horses run that uh, late. And particularly at that high of a level that he's still running in stakes races across the country. And But for him to come in, win that race, what a way to end his 2022. We'll see if we see him back as a 10-year-old, but he still showed he has plenty in the tank in those listed stakes races. He's still somebody to absolutely be considered. Cato River, the overwhelming favorite. I want to say it was one to five at one point. Are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, I like Cato River, but my gosh, one to five. Uh, that just was unbettable. And uh, I kind of baffling, but uh, Cato River, kind of a disappointing effort, finished fifth, if I'm not mistaken, pretty big flop, made a middle move, and then just kind of uh, flattened out and, and got strung out wide and, and fell back coming down the stretch. But 
All credit to Rated R Superstar, a horse that I love. Now, why do I love this horse? Well, for all the reasons I just said, he's almost 10 years old. He represents everything we love in horse racing. But what some people know about me is I have a background in professional wrestling. When I was a kid, my dad, Blaine DeSantis, he is a lawyer, but he also uh, ran a pr independent professional wrestling organization in Reading, Pennsylvania called Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling. And before he was the Rated R Superstar Edge in the WWE, that gentleman wrestled under the name Sexton Hardcastle for my dad's organization in Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling, wrestled for my dad for about a year before he got the call up to the WWF, now the WWE, and became the legend Rated R Superstar. So when I first saw Rated R Superstar pop up as a horse, I always laughed. I always had a chuckle, always brought back great memories of those days in PCW and brought back great memories of those times. And, and I always root for this horse for that reason that I have that connection uh, to the gentleman who is his namesake, I guess, in some ways in edge in the WWE. Now, some other really notable performances at Remington Park on Saturday night. And I love highlighting those kind of secondary tracks when they have their big days. But obviously the springboard mild wild Atlantic storm winning the springboard mile for Ray Ashford Jr. and Leandro Goncalves on the mount. Just a perfect trip and a great job by Goncalves. Hustling this horse up, was stuck out wide in that nine hole, doesn't have a really long run into that first turn, really hustled him up, got him in a good position, just be stalking off of Echo again, and then made the move down the stretch, won easily uh, in the springboard mile at a big price. I want to say 15 to one uh, on, by the time the post uh, broke, but it was a, a great effort there. But the big story were the two big name shooters coming in from the outside, Echo again and giant mischief for uh, Brad Cox. Echo again, I, I was out on this horse going into that race. Uh, anybody who's listened to me on that uh, uh, Friday morning live stream with Gino and Barry knows that I was kind of all the way out on Echo again. I, I just, that it was a disappointing effort at the Iroquois coming off the layoff. I, I just didn't think Echo again was really up to the same caliber and, and wasn't going to win, uh, had the lead. Uh, ran very strong fractions, but but by no means suicidal fractions, and just didn't have it down the stretch. Think there might be some distance limitations with this horse, but we'll see. So, you know, we'll see second back uh, if he improves at all. Uh, and of course, he does have a no contest win or a no contest effort, I should say, not a win, but a no contest effort in there as well. So his running lines are a little bit skewed. It looks like he's only now had three races. He has actually had four, uh, but that one was declared a no contest. But the big story coming out of the springboard mile was not Wild Atlantic Storm, but rather Giant Mischief, the Brad Cox horse who hopped at the break. He was the favorite going into this race, hopped at the break, with, came out dead last, was dead last for the kind of first stretch, then made this incredible move and just circled the entire field, kind of dug in again coming down the stretch and really came within about a length and a half of uh, getting to Wild Atlantic Storm. So a huge effort from Giant Mischief. And, and I couldn't help but think back to Simplification, one of my favorite horses from last year, and his effort in the Holy Bull. If you remember back to that race early this year, where Simplification was the favorite going into that Holy Bull and completely blows the break, finish is dead last. You, and up to that point, he had been a horse that a lot of people thought needed the lead. All of a sudden, he's dead last early. He circles the field. He kind of finishes a really strong second place. That really set him up then uh, for to, to win the next time out. And so I, Giant Mischief, same sort of thing. I actually kind of like it when adversity happens to these young horses. This is something I've talked about before. They have to, you learn something about them when things don't go their way, when they have to battle adversity, when they have to go wide and they have to circle an entire field and they get mud kicked up on their face and they have to dig in after they've just been making up all this ground. What do they look like? And the fact that Giant Mischief ran as big as he did in that effort, I mean, that's just so incredibly impressive. Uh, one of the better second place efforts I've seen in 2022, certainly from this two-year-old crop. So a uh, really strong effort there from Giant Mischief, but all credit to Wild Atlantic Storm to win that springboard mile at Remington Park. Well, the Midwest had a lot of great racing over the weekend. A lot of jockeys actually started their day at Oaklawn and then ended their day at Remington Park. Uh, Isaac Castillo and a few others, Ricardo Santana Jr., a couple of other guys uh, did that. So credit to them, always hustling. But uh, at Oaklawn earlier in the day, there were two stakes races. One, the Poinsettia, pretty birdie. 
Wow, really good effort off the layoff. And with a kind of a questionable work over the Oaklawn surface leading into this race, that was what I was a little worried about. That was a that was kind of a substandard work coming onto that Oaklawn uh, track. Now, granted, had performed well at Oaklawn before, but you still worried that last work you thought, mm, is, is this horse firing? Is this horse cranked up? I mean, looking, coming back from a layoff, you always have to take into consideration those works. How effective does this horse look? The fact they turned in such a slow work coming into this last, uh, coming into the poinsettia, you go, well, maybe this horse needs one under the belt. Maybe this isn't the ultimate goal. Man, pretty wordy, just ran a hole through the wind uh, and just ran them off their feet that day at the poinsettia. My value play, Sarah Harper, if you watch uh, Capping the Card, finished a strong second place there, uh, giving you some good value. But all credit to Pretty Birdie, who, like I said, came off the bench and just really blew the, the field away there. Uh, and then you go to the Tinsel Stakes. Val Harbor, the Robertino Diodoro horse, wins my top pick. Last Samurai, oh, just coming in second place. Uh, that was a tough one. But luckily, I hit a few winners earlier in the card at Oak Lawn, so all was not lost on the day. But uh, credit to Val Harbor and Diodoro for a, a great effort there in the Tinsel Stakes. Uh, and Last Samurai is a horse that just, Always runs well, I think, uh, at Oaklawn Park. Just that horse doesn't turn in bad efforts there. Um, of course, the story in between those was the return of Barber Road. And I told you, if you watch Capping the Card, I said fade Barber Road. My good colleague here at Trust the Prophets, Colin Sheehan, was all in on Barber Road. Loved Barber Road. Guess what? Barber Road finished a distance third. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes Colin's right. Now, Here's the thing. Colin was right about Wild Atlantic Storm in the Springboard Mile. Now, that's a pretty impressive thing to be right about. Uh, but he was wrong earlier in the day about uh, 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 Barber Road, who finished distance third in that race. I, I like Barber Road a lot. And, and I, you know, Colin and I gave each other grief. and We just like joking around with each other about it. But he's a horse that he just feels like a horse that finishes underneath a lot. Uh, and which I'm a sucker for. Uh, I mean, I like Xandon. I loved Midnight Bourbon. I mean, I like horses that finish underneath probably way too much. I like sort of simplification. Um, but his running style of kind of coming from the back and needing a hot pace. I mean, he's a dependent horse in some instances, and that's not always the best uh, to be, especially coming back from a layoff. So I, I think we'll see Barbara Road get to the winner's circle in 2023. I do. Uh, but it just it didn't feel like that was his day. Now, the final piece of horse racing news that we'll go over took place out on the West Coast at Los Alamitos, where Tim Yachtin and Ramon Vasquez teamed up with Practical Move to win the Los Alamitos Futurity. Now, that was a big upset, actually. Uh, Yachtin, of course, getting a really big stakes win for his two-year-old with Vasquez up on the mount. But the big story coming out of this was the Bob Baffert monster. Arabian Lion finishing dead last. This was the overwhelming post-time favorite. I think two to five went off. Uh, and this was a horse that was so impressive, so impressive on uh, the undercard of the Breeders' Cup, uh, breaking his maiden that day. Looked so good, finished dead last. Now, there's a lot of speculation from people I trust who say, looks like the horse bled in all likelihood. Um, coming around, you, you had to sense something was wrong Honestly, on the back stretch, uh, I, I just got a sense that something was off. But really, coming around that third and fourth turn, they let the reins out and just uh, the horse was losing ground. And and you know, obviously at that point, you know it's it's a problem. But even down the back stretch, the horse just wasn't traveling as well as you would think, and, and the reins were pretty loose. And and it just that's another thing I like to look at. I try to really pay attention to how tight or loose reins are down the back stretch because it can sometimes give you a sense of who's already all out and who's got a whole lot left in the tank. Now, that's not always the case, but it's something to just pay attention to. But again, congrats to Yak Teen and Practical Move along with Vasquez on the mount. But I think this is another example. A lot of people were excited about Arabian Lion. People were excited about Giant Mischief. People were excited about Echo again. This is why I don't like staking my claim to a derby horse in December. It's just... <laughs> These two-year-olds are so, first of all, they're so precocious in a lot of cases, the ones that we're seeing now, and they're still late developing. I mean, there's still a lot of development left with these horses, and there's horses that haven't run yet who are huge that are going to absolutely be in the picture come the first Sunday in May, Saturday in May, I should say. So uh, I understand people always want to try to clamor. There's kind of a badge of pride. If you can be the first one to identify this great derby horse, wow, you must really be great. 
but I don't love running out and just speculating. This is a derby horse. This is my derby horse. And just calm down. <laughs> the derby will be in five months. We'll see who's there. And once, we, once we're there, then we'll see who's actually going to win the derby. Uh, and even then, you yeah, may have to wait until there's a scratch and somebody draws in to win the derby like they did this year with Rich Strike. So, um, but, you know, like I said, a, a great effort there from Practical Move. Don't want to take anything away from the actual winner, just like with Wild Atlantic Storm. Don't want to take anything away from the winner, even if there are some other compelling storylines taking place underneath. Well, let's shift from the track to some trainer news. And the big news, which is kind of disappointing, is that Steve Asmussen may face a 30-day suspension. Now, that's these things happen. It's from two horses, um, 1,000% and Boulder, who both tested above the permitted limits of the metabolite ACE promosine, and they did so at Churchill and Keeneland, respectively. Now, why is this noteworthy? Well, Asmussen is the winningest trainer in North America. That's one element of this. And anytime that he faces a potential suspension, especially one that's 30 days, it's noteworthy. There's also the fact that these positive tests came from 2018. 2018. Are you kidding me? What year is it now? It is nearly 2023. We are nearly five calendar years removed from these positive tests. And we're now just, just getting to maybe handing out a 30-day suspension. Are you serious? Are you kidding me with this? This is the sort of thing that drives those of us who love this sport absolutely up the wall. It's, yes, the positive tests bother us. There's no doubt about it, okay? But it's the lack of transparency. It's the fact that Blood Horse, who broke this story, has to go out there and file all sorts of information acts to get this information, and even then they can't get all of it. It's ridiculous that something that took place nearly five years ago in two smaller races in June and October of 2018 is now just getting dealt with. What in God's green earth has taken the Commonwealth of Kentucky this long to deal with? And this is this is one of the reasons why I have never been one of these people who bow down to the blue bloods in the sport. Because you want to talk about things wrong? There's a lot wrong in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. There's a lot wrong up in the state of New York. There's a lot wrong out in the state of California. Okay? And just because those are where all the big races are, and just because those are where all the big horses are, we all sit there and bow down to those entities and go, oh, how great is racing in Kentucky? How great is racing in New York or in California? The hell with it. It all stinks. Okay? It all stinks. And... I'm not thrilled that Asmussen is facing this suspension. But at the same time, as upset as as disappointed as I am that there's this suspension, it's also just a reality in the sport that everybody faces suspensions from time to time. And testing above permitted levels is not the worst type of suspension you can face. But nevertheless, the litigation and the lack of transparency, my God. What are we talking about? This comes, of course, on the heels of Mark Cassie, very famed trainer, uh, who actually just won the Breeders' Cup, uh, Breeders' Cup uh, victory this year with uh, Wagon Wheel. Uh, but <clears throat> Mark Cassie wrote an opinion piece for the Thoroughbred Daily News defending Heisa, which I did a whole piece on. If you want to go back and watch that on the Win Play Show, feel free. I talked about its constitutionality, but uh, Mark Cassie wrote a piece in TD TDN that defended Heisa and talked about it last week and. You know, it, it's. I saw a lot of people push back on Cassie's opinion piece, saying he's being naive that there's that there's all these problems with Heisa. That may very well be true, but what I would say is, do not let perfection be the enemy of the good. Okay, do not let it be the enemy of progress. It's never going to be perfect. No system we come up with is going to be perfect. There's going to be problems with it. And whether it's oversight, whether it is the structure of it, whether who's sitting at the table, et cetera, there's always going to be problems. There's always going to be problems, but we have to move in a better direction than what we have right now. So some very disappointing news. Like I said, disappointing from an Asmussen standpoint, and it's certainly you don't like to see that, but also disappointing with just how it's being dealt with. Like, my God, uh, this is just like the hearing official parted ways and then new people had to come in. And now, like I said, five calendar years later, 
it's finally maybe getting dealt with. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Well, speaking of things that are ridiculous, and to some extent just arbitrary, the, the Graded Stakes Commission came out with their who's up and who's down, maybe their own naughty and nice list this time of year, who lost grade one status and who gained a grade one status as well as grade two, grade three, and listed stakes races. Now, we're not going to go over the grade three and the listed stakes because those are a pretty long list, but we will cover what happened with those grade one, grade two races. In terms of, there's a lot more races that lost status than gained status on this top end. So five Count them five races lost grade one status. That is the Woodward Stakes, the Cigar Mile, the Clark, the Starlet, and the Rodeo Drive. All five of those have lost grade one status, have been downgraded to grade two status. I know a lot of us talked about the Clark field this year being particularly weak. I think the element of the, the reality of the, how the Breeders' Cup impacts things, I think the reality of how horses are run these days and how limited the older dirt male division is is all those reasons why the clark has been downgraded now to a grade two uh obviously disappointed to see the cigar mile and woodward get uh downgraded but not altogether surprising based upon the size of those fields and the quality of the horses that have been attracted to those fields of late the starlet the rodeo drive same sort of thing not surprising those were kind of what i would consider weaker grade ones um the fact that none of the derby preps lost grade one status is a little disappointing i know chuck simon uh who i'm a big fan of. I know Chuck really believes that no Kentucky Derby prep races should be grade ones. Uh, I guess the Starlet is technically a, a Derby uh, trail race, um, but none of them should be grade ones because his idea is that if you're prepping for something bigger, then then how's it a grade one? That if you're prepping for a grade one, that you're not prepping in another grade one. Um, and it, There's logic to that, but logic be damned. This is horse racing, so that doesn't always take place. Now, there is one race that gained grade one status, the Stephen Foster. Happy to see that. Great to see the Stephen Foster get that grade one status back. So net of four grade ones being lost, all right? So we five were lost, one was gained. Overall, four fewer graded state, grade one stakes races in the United States next year. And then you look at grade two status, six or uh, six race, uh, six uh, stakes races lost their grade two status. The Sorrento, the Dinner Party, the Monrovia, the San Marcos, the Santa Inez, and then the Tampa Bay Derby all lost grades two status and were all downgraded to grade three. Now, the Beaumont at Keeneland, the Franklin Simpson at Keeneland, and the Lady Sprint stakes at uh, Kentucky Downs all gained grade two status. So overall, there was a net loss of three grade two races uh just between those obviously then you also have those grade ones that were downgraded to grade two so they're i guess a net positive one uh overall but like i said it is uh there are some shakeups there obviously I, I think we need to have fewer of these races quite frankly i think there's a very deep discussion that needs to take place about how we talk about turf graded stakes races in the united states because it's hard to continue to justify a lot of grade one turf races if we just get our clocks cleaned every time the Europeans come over um, in the Breeders' Cup. And so then it kind of begs the question is, are we really properly grading these turf races? Uh, and, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. I, I, I love turf. I think that's where the future of the sport is in many ways, but and that and synthetic. But I, I think that ooh, it is rough to uh, see some of those what I consider to be very weak turf fields that still have that kind of grade two, grade three status sometimes, especially up in New York, out in California, where you're like, oh, this is a listed stakes race at best, probably. Um, but we'll see. So a little bit of a shake up there, obviously, with the Woodward, the Cigar Mile, the Clark, the Starlet and the Rodeo Drive all losing that grade one status. Stephen Foster gaining grade one status this year. So we'll finish up this week by talking about somebody who's going to be walking away from the sport in 2023, and that is. Hall of Fame jockey, future Hall of Fame jockey, Frankie Dettori, who is retiring, going on a global farewell tour that is kicking off next Monday, December 26th, as he will be running at Santa Anita. And that is, and coincidentally, where his career might also conclude as 
course, the Breeders' Cup is being held at Santa Anita in 2023. So it would be, you know, somewhat symmetrical for him to start this farewell tour at Santa Anita and end that farewell tour at Santa Anita. Obviously, Frankie is a great jockey and someone who I think has brought a lot of charisma, a lot of charm to the game, doing the backflips off the horse, always a, a highlight. He's somebody who's got a big personality. I love people like that uh, because it just makes this, them easy to root for, in my opinion, it makes the sport more compelling, more interesting when you're when you can connect with every level of the horse, right? When you love the horse, you love the jockey, you love the trainers, you know, the owners. I mean, just if the more you can stack up, the more you can build connections with horses. We all love the horse, but if you love the horse and the jockey, oh, that, that's an added bonus. If you love the horse, the jockey, and the trainer, ah, even better. If you love the horse, the jockey, the trainer, and the owner, even better. So if you, you know, if you get more of these people who have big personalities or people like, uh, you know, like I said, it's just good for the sport. So, we wishing obviously Frankie all the best on this farewell tour, certainly a healthy farewell tour uh, and a successful one from the standpoint of getting into the winner's circle, but he's somebody who's brought a lot of joy to the sport over the years and he will definitely be missed. Well, that is going to wrap it up for today's episode of the Win Play Show. Make sure to like and comment below with your thoughts on this episode, as well as who's on your naughty and nice list. You know my nice list. I'm a pretty generous guy. You know, I was a teacher for a long time. I tend to be generous this time of the year with grades. My students were very much so appreciated that this semester. But listen, you know, Beverly Park, definitely on the nice list. Rated R Superstar on the nice list. Flightline, I don't care what anybody says. He's on my nice list. Simplification, permanently on my nice list. There's a lot of horses on my nice list. My naughty list, eh, we'll get into that later. Uh, there's some people maybe who are on my naughty list. The horses, hey, they're all all right. Uh, but uh, I hope you and yours have a great holiday season, like I said up top. Please be safe. Uh, we have another great episode of the Win Play Show coming out tomorrow. Interview with Jessica Tugwell. Listen, if you love horse pedigree, if you love talking horse pedigree, learning about pedigrees, you need to tune into this episode, okay? Jessica is one of the most knowledgeable people in horse racing pedigree that's out there. I talked to her for about 25, 30 minutes about horse racing pedigree. You don't want to miss that episode. Make sure to tune in tomorrow. Make sure the best way to do that, of course, just either A, follow me on Twitter at the handle at Fail to Menace, or make sure to subscribe to Trust the Profits here on YouTube. But other ways, my name is Matthew DeSantis. You can find me on Twitter at the handle at Fail to Menace, and I am wishing you and yours a happy holiday season, wishing you all the success of the track, and reminding you that is now post time.